Each one of you in this room represents a world. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so each one of us, our world that we live in. Now I realize that the world is a big place, but I realize that your world is different from other people's world. There's things going on in your life. And God wants to bless you. And he loves your world. He loves you. You live in your world. And God loves you. As I study the scriptures, I, you know, I'm, I'm, a lot of people are caught up in the crowds. They're caught up in the, the size of crowds. Uh, pastors try to um, say or want bigger crowds to come to church. And who doesn't want bigger crowds? Of course we do. Because bigger crowds, the more people that are touched by the word of God. But understand me, it's not the size of the crowd. It's the power and the anointing of the message. Each one of you need to be touched by the Spirit of God. And it's not as a group of people, each one sits here individually with needs in your life. And if God can put his finger on you, then I have accomplished my job as a preacher by the Lord being able to put his finger on you and help you. And so I'm thankful for the fact that we can get together and exhort one another and rejoice and praise God. But we need to focus individually on the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. I thought about the big crowds, and Jesus preached to big crowds. Don't get me wrong. Jesus preached to big crowds. But he also preached to small crowds. In fact, it was a pretty small crowd at Jacob's well there in John chapter 4. It was, a pretty good, it, it was a pretty small crowd in the last three verses of John chapter 6 when Jesus Christ said, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life, and they scattered. And it was such a small crowd that Jesus Christ asked them, Will you go away also? And the announcement was, to whom shall we go? Peter said, thou hast the words to eternal life, he said to Jesus. And he does have the words to eternal life. Jesus preached to small crowds such as Jacob's well. Small crowds such as the last seven verses of John chapter 6. Did you know the upper room was a small crowd? The 12 disciples and one left and that left 11. And much of your great um, upper room discourse was spoken to a small crowd. By that chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 was spoken to a small crowd. In fact, Jesus Christ, well, let's go back to the upper room. Even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how many gathered in the upper room to pray and wait for the promise of the Father? Another small crowd. 120. Think about what I'm saying. Was there a massive crowd at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Yes. But not very many of them was on his side. It was a small crowd. At the tomb where Jesus Christ had evacuated, had left the tomb, resurrected from the grave, there was a very small gathering at the tomb where Jesus rose again from the grave. And so listen to me very carefully. God can do something incredible in your life. And he doesn't need the masses or the multitudes to do so. God is concerned about every person in this room. And by that, I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to St. Luke chapter 5 and verse 5. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. St. Luke chapter 5 and verse 5. They are gathered at the lake called Gennesaret. Jesus Christ is coming up, and there are two ships there at the lake of Gennesaret, there at the uh, shore side, and they're washing their nets. They're mending their nets. They're washing their nets. And so Jesus comes up to them and says to them, launch out into the deep. Now, Jesus took the ship, and as they 
he used the ship as an amplification off the water to speak the word of God. And after he spoke the word of God, he told Simon, launch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a catch. And here's what Peter said to Jesus when Jesus Christ said, go out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Notice the scripture says, at God's word, Peter said, I will let down the net. And he did. And when he did let down the net, the net was so filled with fish, it began to break. And there was so much fish where he let down the net in the lake of Gennesaret that he had to call the other ship to come and help him bring the fish to shore. And when the fish were brought to shore, Simon Peter fell on his face, on his knees, at the feet of Jesus Christ and said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Well, God didn't want him to depart. Jesus didn't want him to leave. Jesus wanted to make him a fisherman of men. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did with Simon Peter and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. He made them fishers of men. Notice, Jesus, notice Peter said, nevertheless, we've fished all night, nevertheless. We've toiled, we've sweated, we've labored. We've fished this fishing hole all night long. They fished at night. We fished all night long. We have went to every little crack and, and corner in the lake of Genesaret. We have been up and down uh, around everywhere, around that rock and around that rock and around that uh, a bluff and around that uh, 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 cul-de-sac in the water. We've been everywhere and we have taken nothing. And we have worked hard to get our nets mended and we've worked hard to get our nets washed. But Jesus, if you say, don't give up. If you say, launch out again. If you say, at your word, let down the net, we will do so. And in doing so, God rewarded Peter for obedience. And God will do the same thing for you. I want to use for a subject tonight, these are never the last days. You may be seated. These are the never the less days. Now, if it wasn't for that nevertheless, I'd have probably, I probably would have been out of the ministry a long time ago. That big word, three words jammed together, never the less, if it wasn't for me continuing to, even in the storm, even in the hard times, to just nevertheless just keep on going, nevertheless just keep on pushing, nevertheless never give up, nevertheless just keep doing what God tells you to do, nevertheless just keep listening to what God says to do. Amen? Peter said, we've toiled all night. And when he said we, he meant James and John, the sons of Zebedee and himself. They had toiled all night. They had caught nothing. They were tired. They were sweaty. They were worn out. And that fishing hole had no fish in it. As far as they were concerned, there was nothing there. And Jesus Christ said, go back to the same spot you were at. Just go a little deeper and throw your net out a little deeper and you'll find a great catch. Now, let me say this right now. You maybe have fished a fishing hole, spiritually speaking, for years and taken nothing. You maybe have prayed and seen no results. You maybe have done and seen nothing happen and you've went over and over again and nothing happened. But let me say this tonight. Do it again. Do it again, do it again, do it again, and again, and again, and again, because these are never the less days. Amen. 
These are nevertheless days. I remember they had a, I was raised on, um, mom would go to the store and buy them great big old thick cornflake uh, cereal. I may remember the great big old boxes of cornflake cereal. And I ate so many cornflake cereals that I, I, I just didn't want to see another flake for the rest of my life. And then they came out with a commercial after I got older. And that commercial was, these cornflakes are good. Taste them again for the first time. I did, and they still were horrible. <laughs> but God is not that way. Because God has success for you. I mean, believe that's true. God does. He has success for you. And you need to get it in your spirit. Get it in your liver. Nevertheless. Did you hear what I said? Get it in your liver. Nevertheless. Whatever God wants. Whatever God has called you to do. Obey the Lord. And listen to what God says. Let me show you another passage of scripture that I think is very important. And, and I just want to say this. Nevertheless, at God's word, we need to press on. Everybody say press on. Yes. Nevertheless, at God's word, we need to press on. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Paul says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, meaning I haven't caught it, hadn't, hadn't conquered it. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things. Everybody say those things. God's got some good things for you. Those things that God has for you, reaching forward to those things which are before. He says, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's a couple of things I want to point out right now. If you're going to win, if you're running a race, you've got to press. If you're going to achieve anything, if there's anything that you've got to exert yourself at, you have to press in. There is no victory until you press in. You have to press in. People that lay back and hold back, they're never going to do anything for God. But people that press in, well, not only do things for God, great things for God, they'll do great things for themselves. They'll achieve. Don't spend your life looking backwards. Hello. I said, don't spend your life looking backwards. Don't spend all your time looking in that rear view mirror and driving down the road looking in that mirror because you're going to hit something looking behind you. You're going to hit something in front, right? I am. Uh, we need to understand that the windshield is much bigger than that little rear view mirror. I also understand that in the future, you're going to buy a car if you can afford a new car. And in the future, your car is not going to have mirrors on the sides. Your car is not going to have a rear view mirror up on the windshield. It shines out the back window. In fact, your car may not even have a back window. In the future, they will have cameras in your car. And you will look on the dashboard and have and seen, see everything that you'll ever need to know by looking at those cameras. Those cameras will tell you what's beside you. Those cameras will tell you what's behind you. Are you listening to me? I'm not an airplane pilot. I'm not a jet pilot. Aren't you glad you're not on board if I were? I'm not a jet pilot. I can't fly a jet. I can ride one. I'm pretty good at riding one. When I ride a big old jet airliner somewhere, I help them out as they're taking off the runway I go. I help them out. And when they land, I help them out. And I break them. And that, those big old planes could never stop without my help. I understand that. Now, here's what you think. God can never get anything done in my life without my help. Well, yes, he can. In fact, sometimes you're more of a hindrance than you are a blessing to God. 
Come on, that's a good statement. You didn't like it, but it's a good one. You can't spend all your life looking back behind you. I heard a little riddle or a little old poem that went something like this. The lightning bug is a bright little fella. Though he doesn't have any mind, he goes through life with his headlights on behind. And there's a lot of people that go through life with their headlights on behind. Hello. And I'm not going to live a life looking behind me. I'll be quite, uh, Paul said, I press forward. And I, maybe I've toiled all night, but this is a nevertheless day that we live in. Nevertheless, I'm going to church. Nevertheless, I'm going to preach. Nevertheless, I'm going to serve God. Nevertheless, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Nevertheless, I'm going to keep praying. Nevertheless, I'm going to keep reading my Bible. Nevertheless, I'm going to keep looking up. Nevertheless, I'm going to keep pushing on and pressing on and going on. Nevertheless, despite the adversity, despite the pressures, I'm going to nevertheless listen to God and do what he says. Amen? And so it's so vital and important that we understand that our past is past. That's it. it. Did you know that's why it's called past? Did you know why they call past past? Because it's past. That's why they call it past. And I've heard people tell me, and I've heard people heard. I've heard people say this. Oh, bless God, if I had my life to live over again, I wouldn't change a thing. They fell off a turnip truck somewhere. Because I can tell you right now, if I could live my life over, I would change a lot of things. Amen. Are you listening to me? I'd change a lot of things. I'd, I'd change friendships. I'd change relationships. I, there's a lot of things I'd change. I'd change uh, uh, sins that I committed, things that I do wrong. I'd change all that. I would be in a totally different, in fact, a lot of people would be in a totally different world if I changed my past. But you see, God doesn't change our past. He forgives our past. And so I can't change my past. And if I could, I'd go back and change it. I'm not going to be super spiritual in here and tell you, bless God, I wouldn't change a thing. Well, there's a lot of things I'd, I'd change. One thing is I changed is I'd marry Judy, my wife, much earlier than what I did. I'm being honest. We'd have more children, but I'd have married her quicker. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I would change, and, and, but I can't. So what I've got to do is I've got to make sure that I take care of today and tomorrow. And Jesus Christ gives us today and tomorrow and we can trust Jesus for today and tomorrow and Jesus can mop up all the spills of the past and we can celebrate today. That's good stuff, amen. I said that's good stuff. I met people that live in the past, literally live in the past. Everything is about how they messed up or they did wrong. You can't change it. But you can change where you're at sitting right now, amen. I've used this illustration before. There are people that live in the past so bad that they're like someone that goes out in their backyard and they dig up the septic tank lid. And they pull, some of you don't know what a septic tank lid is, but anyway, <laughs> Maybe they go down to see sewer. I don't know. Anyway, they lift up the septic tank lid. And they pull that lid up, and that aroma floods their nostrils. And they relive the past, and they stand over that manure hole. And they go, Poof! and when they come out, you can't stand to be around them. Amen? We had a cat that I 
what's that cat called? Tracker? Is that what they called? Cracker. Cat. Cracker was a was a cat. Was a looked kind of like a Siamese type cat. But Cracker had a problem. Cracker would not shut up. Const How many remember Cracker? The little white cat we had. Some of you. Well, Josh does. And and Cracker would not shut up. Meow, 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 meow. Day and night. And one day, Cracker disappeared. I said, thank you, Lord. Well, Cracker showed up about two days later. And Cracker was full and covered with manure. Cracker had went down to the sewage in Sparta, Missouri, and Cracker had managed some way to fall over in the pit. And she came home. Covered with sewage. Now the best thing for a man to do was just shoot it. But no, Judy touched it. Meow, meow, meow. And by the way, Cracker was cross-eyed too. And Judy took that thing into the bathroom and put it in the bathtub and scrubbed it up. Meow, 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 meow. And you'd think that that cat could take care of Judy, but Judy can take care of that cat. And she baptized him in the name of every name you could think of. <laughs> and that cat came out. Meow, meow, clean. It finally disappeared. Somebody stole it, thank God. <laughs> and it didn't get killed because it only went through two of his lives, so it had another seven to go. But maybe you're like, maybe you're like that cat. Maybe you've fallen off into the sewage. And Jesus wants to take you and wash you and cleanse you. He wants to bless you. Amen? You got to release the past. You've got to let it go. You've got to march on. Nevertheless, we need to serve God. Nevertheless, we need to press on. Number two, nevertheless, I am not ashamed or embarrassed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed or embarrassed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Now, Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles, and Paul suffered many things, many pressures, and he said, said, for this cause I've suffered many things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed. That's why he wasn't ashamed. He knew Jesus. That's why he wasn't ashamed. He knew that he could believe in Jesus, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. How many in this room ever had that day? I've had lots of that days. Hello? Sometimes that day is a Monday. Sometimes that day is a Tuesday. Sometimes that day is a Wednesday. Sometimes that day is a Thursday. Sometimes that day is a Friday. Sometimes that day is a Saturday. Sometimes that day is today, Sunday. Right? Man, there's been some Sundays. I've been so tired when I got through preaching. I get up at four and come and pray till eight and, and preach three times in the service. And, and, uh, and, and Josh sings three times in the service, leads us in. I don't know how he does. But he sings. And uh, sometimes I go home and I just say, Judy, just shoot me. I just lay in bed and let Judy take the covers and tuck them up to my chin. And I just lay there and I just pass out. Now, I love Sunday and I love serving the Lord. But you know, it's not always a bed of roses. It's not always, preacher, good to see you. Sometimes they're walking the around the block to keep from getting around you. Amen? 
It's not always, that's a good preaching preacher, I love you. It's not always that. Sometimes you find very, you're very critical of your own self. And, um, and Paul said, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. He said, even though I suffer, I'm not ashamed. For which cause I suffer these things. And what things did he suffer? Well, there was many things he suffered. But he says, I'm not ashamed to suffer. And I'm not ashamed to be mocked. I'm not ashamed to be different from the world. I'm not ashamed to be hated. I'm not ashamed to, 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 to not fit in. I'm not ashamed of that. Because Jesus Christ is our only precious tool and power and God that can take us home. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Maybe I don't fit in, but I'm still going to serve God. Maybe people growl and snarl at me, but I'm still going to serve God. Maybe Satan comes and whispers in my ear and says, what's the use? Give up. But I'm still going to serve God because we live in a nevertheless day. This is a nevertheless day. No matter what you're facing, it may be dark, it may be bleak, it may be a storm, it may be a sickness, it may be a trial, but I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ says, nevertheless, launch out into the deep, let down your net, hear the voice of God, and nevertheless, don't be ashamed or embarrassed to serve your God in this God-hating world. Amen. Nevertheless, just serve God. Last but not least, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. How many know the foundation of God does stand sure? Amen. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I'm glad that we have a foundation under us. His name is Jesus Christ. It's the blood of the Lamb. It's the power of God. It's that Jesus is Lord and God Almighty. We have a foundation that we can stand on, that we can trust, and the foundation of God stand sure. Politics can wash apart and break apart. Storms can beat the ship to pieces. Trials can come, darkness can come, sickness can come, even death can come. But God has set us on a foundation, and that foundation is the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for our sin and the rest resurrection from the grave and one day he's going to return with a shout with the voice of an archangel the trump of God and our God is going to step down from the banister of the golden banisters of heaven and our God's going to step down however way it is one step to the Milky Way one step to the quasar but he's going to step down to the clouds of glory and the, and the atmosphere above us is going to shatter like glass and God's going to say come up hither and we're going to go up to meet our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure I want to say to everybody in this room don't give up keep pressing don't get discouraged keep going don't allow yourself to be pulled down or pulled apart. Keep serving God. There's a nevertheless. I said there's a nevertheless. Now this may shock you, but 20 years from now, you won't even remember what's bugging you now. So you ain't got nothing that a 20 year fix won't cure. Most of you were worried about something two months ago and you can't remember what it was now. But your whole world was coming to an end because two months ago you were gone. But it's been two months now and you can't even tell me what it was. 
Hello? What am I saying? God loves and saves crazy people. Right? Hello? God knows that we have springs that ping, ping, ping go different directions. God knows that. God knows that what's bothering us today, we won't even remember a few months from now. Some of you won't remember it a few hours from now. Hello? Now, there are long trials, and there are long battles, and there are long valleys that you'll go through. But you will go through them. It's not over. I said, it's not over. And it won't be over until you step over on the other shore. Because Jesus Christ promised to get you there. Now, some of you weren't here for our first service this morning. I was preaching on John 14. And Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, that makes you not an atheist. Believe also in me, that makes you a Christian. In my Father's house are many mansions. If not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He says, you know the way. You know where I'm going. You know, where, you know what's happening. You know. And Thomas says, we don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. Well, he just told Thomas where he was going. Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And, and it's just like Jesus has to put up with that mess. And Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. He just said he was going to his father's house to prepare a mansion for him. Well, Thomas says, we don't know the way. He just said, come on. He just said, the cheese is falling out of that boy's sandwich. He just said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you there. I mean, our first service this morning was so good, I had to share a piece of it. And I'm not going to preach it on because it would take too long. But if you if you've missed this morning, get a hold of it. We talked about the disciples, Simon Peter. And talked about Thomas and Philip. And we talked about Ju Judas, not Iscariot. And Judas, not Iscariot, later took the name of, of Thaddeus. And I thought he ought to took the name James. But there was already two Jameses. There was James the sons of thunder, and then there was James the less, and I'm the James the lesser, but anyway, it's just too good of stuff. And I, I realize I'm, re I'm repeating myself, but some of you weren't here for the first service, and so there you go, you got it. And Jesus Christ said, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, the life, Nobody goeth to the Father or cometh to the Father but by me. That's pretty dogmatic, isn't it? That's pretty incredible. And so I want to say to everybody in this room, whatever you're facing, you just stick that nevertheless in your heart. You just say, this, these days are nevertheless days. Nevertheless, I will not quit going to church. Nevertheless, I will not stop my, uh, praying, praying and reading my Bible. Nevertheless, I will not stop praising God. Nevertheless, I'll stay in church. I'll stay praising God. Nevertheless, I'll stay in faith and I'll stay serving the Lord Jesus Christ because I know, as Terry Wilkins used to sing, there is a brighter day coming. And there is a brighter day coming. Now, there may be someone in this room that you've never given your heart to Jesus. Maybe you've never been saved. You say, well, preacher, are you picking on me? No, I'm just saying I don't know your heart. I don't know whether you're saved or not. Only you know that. 
And there may be someone in this room that's never been born again. You've never been saved. You, 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 you uh, like the lady that used to go to a church where I was preaching in Stockton in revivals and the lady, she wasn't saved and she'd sit on the front row and she'd say, I hate you. She'd do that. She'd come up to me after service, I hate you. And I finally got mad about it and said, well, quit coming. Why don't you just not come if you hate me? She said, well, I gotta come. I said, why do you got to come? She said, because I want to see what you're going to say next. <laughs> and she hated me. And she wasn't saved. But one night, God got a hold of her, and Jesus, God the Father, dragged her to the altar. The Holy Spirit met her there baptized her into the body of Christ, into the person of Jesus Christ. She was born again by the Spirit of God. She come up from that altar, wrapped her arms around my neck. I thought she was going to hang me, choke me to death because she hated me. And she started jumping up and down with her arms around me and kissing my cheek and said, I so love you. I thought, boy, I liked her better when she hated me. Go back to your seat. Because we know we're teasing. Later on, she went to be, now listen to this. Later on, she went to the nursing homes. And every person that had problems, she would gather them up in a van. She finally got a bus. And she found this place where children had birth defects and, they, you know, they... Down syndromes and whatever that needed special care, and you know some of the children would just out of the clear blue ah and make noises and you know kind of like typical Pentecostal, but anyway just just make noise. And she brought them to the church. I loved it. She'd line them up in the church. I loved it. I said, "Bring them on, bring them on." And and those kids were just adorable. The, most of them couldn't walk and couldn't talk and they were just adorable. And one day uh, we, we stopped doing the evangelism there. It wasn't a church, it was an evangelistic center. And I had to go out to California out west. And, and when I did, she took those children to another church. And I'm not gonna tell you the name of the church because that's not either here nor there, it's not important. But she took that bunch to another church. And that church was full of people that were full of starch. And they went to her and said, do not bring them back ever again. And she looked at them, that preacher and said, I hate you. <laughs> and said, here we go again. No, she didn't hate him, but it burned her up that that happened. And later on, he, her husband became a preacher. She became a, uh, a preacher's wife and a great uh, lady of God. I think they live in Kansas City now. I hadn't heard from them in a long time, but they were serving the Lord. I just want to say this. Don't give up. It'd be easy to get discouraged, but don't give up. If your pockets are empty, don't give up. If the bill due is coming constantly, don't give up. If you're having physical ailments, don't give up. Just nevertheless keep serving the Lord. Amen? Hello? Now, I used to have a pop addiction. I, I was going to say Coke, but you would take that wrong. I used to have a pop addiction. And I, I ran out of money. And if you know anything, if you're addicted to pop, you've got to have it every day. It's kind of like your coffee. And I just had to have a pop. I was so thirsty. I was pastoring down on the square. I was so tired. Everybody knew me, and I needed to drink a pop. No one was around. And so I just went up to the convenience store. And I didn't have a nickel in my pocket. And I just walked in there and just wandered around. Just wandered around. I just window shopped. Just wandered around. And I finally decided, well, you know what? I've got to believe God for this. So I reached in the cooler, and I got me a bottle of pop. I didn't have a nickel in my pocket. And I made my way to the counter real slow. 
And when I finally got to the counter and laid the pop down on the counter, a hand hit me on the shoulder. Hello, preacher. It's good to see you. Let me buy that for you. I said, no, I'll, yeah, go ahead. And he bought that for me. He said, what's that got to do with the sermon? Nothing, but I love telling the story. God takes care of us. He watches over us. So there may be someone in this room right now that you, you're not sure about going to heaven. You're not sure that you're ready. Jesus made it so simple. Jesus made it so easy for us. All we have to do is grieve away from our sin. Grieve away from that which we shouldn't be doing. Come to an altar and ask Jesus Christ for forgiveness and allow the Spirit of God to lead you in a new life. That's what Donnie did. Amen. Changed his life. And that's what you that are born again in this room, that's exactly what you did. And you just got to yield to the Lord. Because you see, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, Jesus didn't just say, I have life. Jesus said, I am life. I am life. And Jesus filled me with life. He'll do it for you. Don't give up. Don't give up. Stand with me. Josh, going to come and bring a song. Because these are nevertheless days, Brother Daryl. I have to say, Brother Daryl, Daryl. <laughs> Amen. And these are nevertheless days. So please, never give up. Never let go. Just keep pressing on. Don't let your past hold you down. Don't let your past bring you down. Just serve the Lord. Altar's open. Josh going to play and sing. Maybe you'd like to come up here to an altar and say, I just want to turn my headlights that are on behind off. I just want to put my past behind me. I just want to press in to the things of the Lord. You come. The altar's open.